Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar, where we'll be discussing the tips and tricks and um, that are needed when applying for MSCA postdoctoral fellowship. Hope everyone can hear me. So today we have some amazing speakers with me. Uh, my name is Precious Equere. I am um, a member of the UREXES team. Um, we have some very knowledgeable speakers here with us today, and uh, we'll be throwing light on everything you need to know about applying for the MSCA postdoctoral fellowship. So first of all, we'll be um, the first speaker we'll be having today is Dr. Ahmed Malau. He will be presenting on UREXES Africa. Dr. Ahmed is an associate professor at the University of Salse, Tunisia, and is also the regional representative for UREXES Africa. So the next voice you'll be hearing will be that of uh, Dr. Ahmed Malau. Many thanks. To you. Many thanks. Thank you, dear Precious. I am happy today to, to be with you in this webinar. And uh, first of all, I will present your Access Africa. And uh, before moving to uh, MSA uh, individual fellowships. So uh, let me uh, present first of all my myself. So I am a regional representative for your Access Africa, and I am associate professor at the University of SUS in Tunisia, and I was former Horizon Europe Digital National Contact Board and Horizon 2020 ICT NCT. So for your access worldwide, uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, your access is initiative of the European Commission established with the aim to provide free access to information about research in Europe, opportunities for research funding, and international collaboration and transnational mobility. It links researchers on the worldwide to Europe. Furthermore, the network is open to all nationalities and research fields. So um, we are in the worldwide. We are in North America, Latin America, Caribbean, India, China, Asia, Australia, Netherlands, Korea, Japan, and uh, uh, we are also in Africa. So uh, the main tasks for Euraccess Africa, first of all, management and development of Euraccess Africa network, support for African researchers by providing information, advice, and assistance to African researchers and supporting the career development of African researchers who are already working in Europe. Three, promoting European research opportunities in Africa. And four, reinforce the networking with all LNI African actors by organizing events and activities that promote networking and collaboration and facilitating the ex exchange of information and expertise between the two regions. So, um, what you see here uh, is the, uh, the website of Your Access Africa. And if you, you can put in Google your access, and after that, you, you click on the, this top worldwide, and there is the nine hubs, and you can click on Africa. And please sign up for free membership to your 2022. Uh, we have organized many events, many face to face events, uh, online events in South Africa, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, and uh, we have more. In uh, the first year, we have more than 7,000 contacts in our database from Africa. So there are some photos from 2022 in uh, Kenya, in Morocco, uh, also in, uh, in uh, South Africa, in Cape Town, in Egypt. And here you can see our activities for 2023. This is uh, uh, the launch of Mediterranean Initiative in uh, Cairo, uh, Egypt, in uh, first month in 2023. And here uh, there is Access Africa Day uh, in Kigali, Rwanda. Here, Access Africa Day in Kenya, also uh, in, in uh, Nairobi. And uh, today we have two webinars, uh, one in French and one in English dedicated to MSA postdoctoral fellowships. And uh, save the date, we will be in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, in 13th of June for your Access Africa Day. And we have your Access Africa Days 
in South Africa. And we will have two or three days in South Africa uh, to uh, organize many uh, uh, information session and practical workshops related to how to draft a proposal in Europe. So uh, keep uh, this date. You will uh, soon publish this event step by step on Africa Initiative 2. And uh, here, what can you view first of all promote your national research landscape promote your funding opportunities promote your access network invite speakers from the network and connect researchers with research labs so how can we work together first of all invite us to present in your bilateral events if you have events in your laboratory or universities don't hesitate you can invite us we can we can uh, just uh, present uh, uh, opportunities related to uh, mobility, research mobility programs or funding opportunities in through Horizon Europe and Africa Initiative too. Forward us requests about EU funding to go to your countries. Tell us how to, can we uh, uh, can we support you further. So our tools are mainly the website, social media, flash notes, inform information sessions, and practical workshops. So you can see here a screenshot from some news uh, already in our website. Every day we have. Uh, in news about opportunities to uh, uh, like PhD position or postdoctoral fellowship, etc. So, also for the events, you can subscribe. Uh, it is for free. You can participate. You can uh, download all slides for every event, and you can also watch the recording video for each event in our website. For your access portal in general, uh, you can see here then plus then two million visitors per year and plus than 1.2 million page viewed per month, and it is for free. And you can see here, for example, um, in 2021, there is more than uh, 90,000 research positions already published in our uh, UAccess jobs. And for uh, uh, partner, partnering, you can find members and you can find organizations if you look for some partner to to build your consortium in, in Horizon Europe or to find institution or host institution for your fellowships. So you can search for organizations and you can also uh, enhance the visibility of your organization if you want and your visibility if, by creating your profile in your access website. So uh, join us, be informed, be proactive, click on this button and join our community of researchers. We are in Facebook, we are in LinkedIn, we are in Twitter, and we are in, uh, uh, in uh, YouTube also. And our email is africa.uraccess.net. Free, easy, and valuable. So many thanks uh, for you. And now I give you the floor, the precious. Many thanks. Bye bye. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ahmed, for that beautiful presentation. Um, thank you. I hope we all got the presentation. If you want to learn more about your access and what we do, go to the website, follow us on all our social media platforms so that you don't miss another call. Um, thank you so much, Ahmed, once again for that presentation. So our next speaker for the next 25 minutes will be our own Christiana Gomez. She will be talking to us about applying for the MSCA postdoctoral fellowship tips and tricks to use. So she has strong experience in European projects and management. She has experience in mobility and researchers career development. So please, gent um, ladies and gentlemen, pay her your full attention as she will be giving you everything you need to know about applying for this open call. So the next speaker you'll be hearing will be Christiana Gomez. Christiana, please. Thank you very much. Precious, thank you very much, Ahmed and Maruf, also for being here and testifying what an MSCA can do for your career. Thank you to your Access Africa for having me today here and just giving me the opportunity to explain a little bit more about the postdoctoral fellowship of MSCA and the opportunities that you as um, African researchers 
have there. So my name is Cristina Gomez. I am the Spanish National Contact Point and Delegate at FECIT, that is the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, which is one of the two institutions that has been um, designated at national level to support our researchers and our institutions to participate in framework programs. So in the next 25 or maybe 30 minutes, um, I will get through, through the objectives, general rules of the cause, the two implementation modes, the evaluation criteria, I would, and I will try to give you some general advice. So let's start. Let me share my screen with you. And I will just check with my colleagues if you can see it properly. And I think you can, right? Yes. It works. Yes. Perfect. So as you might know, um, MSCA is part of the excellent science pillar of Horizon Europe, which is the funding mechanism that the European Commission, the European Union has to fund research and innovation. MSCA is an EU program that has been funding mobility for over 25 years now. Um, and that looks after the career development and the, the professional development of researchers. It fosters international mobility because you will see that researchers will have to move country to carry out their research projects. It fosters intersectoral mobility because it will build bridges between academia and non-academia non thanks to specific research stays in the private sector and also interdisciplinary mobility, enhancing the collaboration between different profiles in the same research project. It is a bottom-up approach, and that means that both researchers and in institutions will be able to freely choose their research topic, but always ensuring that there is an alignment with the relevant international and European policies, such as the Green Deal, the um, Sustainable Development Goals, the EU missions, for instance. So MSEA promotes the career development of researchers and their training, not only in their scientific field, and I think that's uh, very relevant, but also regarding transferable skills that will equip all of you researchers with the best tools to become more employable in your field. These projects will therefore have an impact at different levels, an impact for you as researchers, because it will improve the professional development that you have and will help you beat on your career at institutional level, because it really aligns the human resources strategy, uh, internal human resources strategy with the EU policies. And it also facilitates to increase the scientific excellence of the institutions. And of course, an impact at RNI um, system, because it really advanced in the area and it will provide research outputs to support public policies, for instance. Now, I just mentioned that MSCA is a bottom-up approach. And that this means that all scientific areas will be covered, but when you submit a proposal, you will have to choose one of those eight uh, scientific panels. I have to say also that the Eurotome areas, meaning um, nuclear fusion, is also allowed and could be financed in this call. So as you can see, um, projects coming from the chemistry field, social sciences, economic sciences, information sciences, environmental, life sciences, mathematics, physics, all of them will be able to be funded. Um, and the project that will be financed will be covered at 100%. Finance at 100%. That's also very important. And it's based on unit cost. I will briefly explain what the unit cost is uh, later on. Um, so you can see the details here of the call. The call opened last month of April with more than over 260 million euros. And it will close in September 13th, uh, 2023. And that's a very important date, the call deadline, because these dates, it's where all the eligibility eligibility criteria, sorry, will be measured. So once the call is closed, actually what's going to happen is that the proposals will be evaluated and the results will be given out in the month of February 2024. There, the European Commission will start to sign what is called the grant, the, the, the grant agreements, which are the contracts that the European Commission signed with the institutions, the beneficiary institutions, that will receive the fund to recruit the researchers. And then researchers, you will be able to start the project somewhere between the month of March 2024 and September 2025. And that's important because as you can see, there's a huge range for you to allow to start a project early enough, or if you need to really postpone it a bit, you can do that. So what does the, the call offer? 
the postdoctoral um, fellowship calls offer two different options. The European mode, that is for projects that will be carried out in Europe at a European institution at the beneficiary for around one to two years. And then the global fellowships mode. And that's for projects that will start outside of Europe for a, for a period of 12 to 24 months and then finish at the European institution in Europe for the last 12 months. Now, you need to know that the researcher will have to choose among the two options. It's not possible for them to submit two projects. So you have to choose either to go for the European or the global uh, possibility. Um, and also, you need to know that if you have submitted a previous um, proposal to this call last year, and you intend to submit the same proposal because you didn't manage at the first time with the same institution, you need to score at least 70 out of 100 to be able to resubmit. Another aspect to consider, and I think that's a, a very good novelty from Horizon Europe, is that for researchers with a project with expected results to be exploited by the industry, for instance, or for a researcher who really thinks that his or her career can continue at a company, at the private sector, it's possible to have an extension of uh, six months after the project of what we call a non-academic placement, which is a specific research stay in Europe at the private sector. It's not mandatory, it's possible. So we are talking here about an individual project, but how does it work? How can you apply for that? You need to know that the institution is the one who will receive the funding. The institution that is based in Europe, that we call beneficiary, is the institution who will recruit you as a researcher and who will train the potential MSCA fellow. And this institution could be from the academic sector and the non-academic sector. Here, this is just a definition from the European Commission to somehow uh, define this intersectorality of the program. So academic, normally it's a university or a research center, and non-academic, any other institution where a researcher can really develop a career. And that can be a small and medium enterprise, that can be a museum, an NGO, or a public administration. Um, and in case you have a fellowship where you want to carry out specific research stays outside of your beneficiary in Europe, that's also possible. That's what we call secondments or placements. Okay, that's a possibility. Um, and then what, what you see there is the, the researchers, okay, who apply the beneficiary, the institution will receive the funding, but we have a, a researcher, the potential fellow who will apply. And we also have at the institution who is the beneficiary, a supervisor that will somehow guide the researcher in his or her career development during the project. And now if you, have behind, if you are behind the screen and you think, okay, am I eligible to apply? In case you wish to apply for one of the two options, you need to consider what we're going to be talking about the edge eligibility is that we need to know your research experience. I'm going to be talking about that in the next slides. Um, there is a specific restriction for the Global Fellowship concerning your nationality. Um, and then you have to see the mobility rule. Where have you resided or lived? Uh, lived or resided or carry out your research before the call deadline. As I mentioned before, very important. All these criteria, we're going to measure them at uh, this date, which is the 13th of September 2023. Now, consider considering the research experience. This is a call for postdoctoral researchers, and it means that you need to have your PhD at the deadline of the call and not more than eight years of research experience. This means that um, you need to count your research activities, for instance, with contracts that you've had at your university, and those must not add up more than eight years. But for instance, if you have had a paternal or a maternal leave, or if you've been unemployed for a specific time, this time will not count towards your research experience. All these exceptions are considered, and the European Commission has provided with an Excel file and specific guidelines for you to ensure that you are eligible concerning uh, your uh, research experience. Then, what is a European fellowship? This is the first option, and it's for projects that will take place in Europe for, again, as I mentioned before, 12 to 24 uh, months, and it's open to all nationalities, so no restriction whatsoever. 
What happens concerning mobility is that the researcher cannot have resided in Europe in the country where the project will take place for more than one year in the three years prior to the 13th of September 2023. We talk about the researcher experience criteria already. Um, and please remember that it's possible for you to carry out secondments, these long research states outside of your institution in Europe, anywhere in the world. And if applicable, the project could be extended for a period of six months. So again, here, all researchers from Africa, no restriction nationality, so you can apply for European fellowships. And for instance, if there is a, a representative from an African organization who will be interested in hosting a secondment, because those can take place any part in the world, that will be also possible. Let's see a specific example, and I just took the, the opportunity to use there my colleague Ahmed. I hope it's okay with him, but uh, that, let's see this example, okay? So Ahmed is a Tunisian researcher who is living in Italy for the last four years, and he has obtained his PhD um, at a Tunisian institution, and he obtained that in October 2015. So concerning eligibility, this project is fine uh, because um, Ahmed will uh, be applying for a fellowship in Spain. And that's just the, the, the beneficiary, the institution in the Basque country. That's a, um, actually a Basque center on cognition, brain and language that is situated in Spain. So Ahmed has not resided in Spain. He's been living in Italy for the last four years. Uh, he is a researcher from Tunisia. That's not a problem, no restriction nationality. And he got his PhD in October 2015. That means that he got his PhD a little bit less than eight years ago, and he has been doing research for the last, uh, for this like, this like almost eight years. So it is eligible. That will be an eligible project, just for you to have, you know, a very clear idea about this criteria. Then the global fellowship. The second option is a little bit different because it, envis it envisages, as I mentioned, and what we call an outgoing phase. And that's an initial phase outside of Europe from one to two years. And then a final phase in Europe at the 12th month of the institution that will recruit the researchers for the whole three years of the project. Now, uh, let me say that the European Commission differentiates between the European countries and the countries who are associated or are in the process of being associated to Horizon Europe. Europe. For instance, Tunisia is a country that is associated at, uh, to Horizon Europe, so it counts as, a, I would say, European country and can be a beneficiary. And Morocco, for instance, is a, is a country that is in the process of being associated to Horizon Europe, so it can also be a beneficiary um, in a global fellowship to be the European host, I would say. So the rest of African countries um, are considered third countries, and in the global fellowship, these uh, countries can hold this outgoing phase outside of Europe. That's important. For the Global Fellowship, here we have a restriction on the nationality. In the case of African researchers, if you wish to apply, you will need to um, at least have resided five years in Europe somewhere some, uh, somewhere in your, in your career at some point in Europe for a consecutive period of five years. If this is your case, then you can also apply to this uh, option. The mobility rule here must be fulfilled in the third country where the project starts. And I will show you an example. So it means that, um, uh, well, I, I will show you the example. Again, the same uh, other um, aspects remain. You can carry out secondments and you have also possibility to extend the project when the project finished, if it's a, a project that is envisaged to finish at the, at the non-academic country. This is just another example. Of course, this is all fake examples, so don't take them as, as real ones. This is the case of my NCP colleague, actually, who works with me at FACIT, uh, who has a national he is American, but he has resided in Spain for seven years, where he obtained his PhD in October 2015. Now, since January 2023, he lives in Ethiopia, and he wants to ask uh, for a global fellowship with an initial phase in Ethiopia, okay, and a final phase in Europe, in Tunisia. I mentioned to you Tunisia can apply to be host in Europe. This is also possible. Why? Because even though he is American, he's been living in Europe, in Spain for more than five years, and concerning research experience, he's fine because there's not more than eight years of research experience. Concerning mobility, it's also fine. Why? Because he's been only living in Ethiopia for less than a year. He's only living there for uh, the last nine months. So that will be also an example, okay? 
So how does it work? Um, this is not only a research project, and I think this is very, very important, and you need to take this into account. You need to find a way to balance to have research and also training. Uh, you, as a researcher, you will increase your scientific knowledge, for instance, by discovering new methodologies or applying new methods or new protocols. But you will also be trained in transferable skills. And this training at all levels will really impact your professional development. And it will be essential to ensure in the project that there is also a transfer of knowledge between the researcher, the fellow who is looking to apply for the fellowship, the supervisor at the institution, and the uh, participating organization. The best projects, that's what we at least see as NCPs, are the projects that are prepared between the different actors, the researcher who applies for the fellowship, the supervisor at the institution where the, where the fellowship will take place. Everybody should be really aware of the timing, the scientific needs, but also the expectations of the uh, researcher who is applying for this uh, project. The funding, that's very important too. So this is the funding and it will be provided to the beneficiary, meaning the institution in Europe. Postdoctoral fellowships are based, as I mentioned before, in unit costs, and those unit costs are triggered by the researcher's recruitment. Okay? It's very easy to understand the budget and it's automatic actually. You will see there on the screen there is a researcher unit cost contribution contributions for researchers recruited to the left hand side. All these allowances are established to cover for the researcher's remuneration. Depending on the number of months of contract, if it's one, two or three year projects, it will vary. And the living allowances will also be adapted to the country. It's true that there are different living standards in France, in Italy, or uh, in Spain, for instance, or uh, in the United Kingdom. So this has been taken into consideration by the European Commission by applying a country coefficient corrector. Now, uh, bear in mind also that you need to know that you need to deduct all taxes, okay? This is not what you will receive as a salary. And I can see Maruf is, is saying, absolutely. So the number, the digits that you see there, the data, you need to, uh, to have a final, I would say, budget, see that you multiply each of them by the number of months of contract, but be aware that please talk to your institution. There are taxes in the different countries and you need to be aware of that. Then what you see also on the right-hand side of the, of the slides is the institutional unit contribution. And this is uh, to cover all your research needs, meaning if you have to buy materials for the lab, if you go into what we call a secondment or a placement, or if you go in to publish something, something of course, all the publication costs are included there in this research training and, in, and networking contribution. So, 100% of a uh, funded project. Please be in contact with the beneficiary also to ensure all this information that I mentioned about uh, taxes. So here, this is just an example of a fellowship that could take place in Spain, for instance, for a period of two months, a European fellowship. And now, if we go into details, um, into the proposal as such, you need to know that you will have two different parts to complete, always with the support of your institution. Please, please, please be in touch with your institutions very early in the process. Um, part A, it's more the administrative part, and you will have to complete online. This is all done online. Uh, details about the institution, the research group, where are you coming from as a researcher, where are you based, your last five years, your CV, uh, the budget that I just showed to you, if there is some ethic and security aspects uh, from the scientific uh, project as such. And these other questions will deal with the secondments or the placements that you might have in your project. Then part B, and this is what I'm going to be talking a little bit more about right now in this final part, is the technical part. Uh, is You have 10 pages to really convince the evaluator that your proposal is the best one. Uh, the excellence, the impact, and the implementation in part B1, we're going to be talking about them. And the part B2, even though there is no limit, you have to include here information with the specific format that is given to you. Uh, the, your CV with information on your CV, then the institutional tables that will include more information on the capacities of the institution that you're going to be doing your, your project at. And 
the screening, security, ethical aspects again. And in the case of global fellowship for the institutions that are based outside of Europe, this institution will have to provide you with a letter of commitment, meaning these institutions do not receive funding, but they are hosting you as a researcher for an initial phase outside of Europe, and the commission wants to know their commitment. So that's also an eligibility criteria. So these are the criteria that three different act experts will evaluate you against. Excellence, impact, and implementation. And you can see the weight of each of them. 50% of the score will go to excellence, 30 to impact, and 20 to implementation. It seems maybe that implementation is only 20% of your project, but be aware you need to score the highest score in all of them. And as I mentioned, three individuals will evaluate one proposal. And these are experts selected by the European Commission. They come from very different fields, very different backgrounds, very different countries, and they will be assigned to your project based on their, on their expertise, but also on the keywords that you will include at submission stage. So that's those keywords and choosing very, very carefully your scientific panel, it is also essential. This table here, without going into details, because of course we will not have time, but um, this table here is to show you the criteria that you will have to write and the sub-criteria sub in each of the different sections. And you need to write all of them. Please do not forget any of them. You need to really answer what uh, the, the commission asks you about excellence, about objectives, about methodology, about supervision, about your own professional experience concerning excellence, about your career perspective, about the outcome, about this, the scientific societal economic impacts, and also on implementation level, the risks that your projects have, the institution and the work plan. So as I mentioned, I'm not going to go into details, but um, I think it's important what it's expected for me, from you when we talk about an excellent project. And an excellent project means, among other things and in other aspects, that you are writing an innovative scientific project with very, very clear objectives that will be achieved by you as a unique researcher who really has the competences to carry out these suggested activities. The methodology that you will use needs to be concrete and detailed, and it needs to be in line with the science, the open science principles of the UN, uh, European Commission, included when applicable, this gender dimension um, in the project. Now, I'm giving you here some policy and strategic documents uh, that are available uh, for you in the, in the documentation. Again, aspects related to uh, open science, I will say, is where results might be shared not only with the scientific community, but also with the citizens as soon as possible. And this is a European Commission demand that must be followed. Gender consideration must be considered also as much as possible and in all research fields. When results, for instance, might affect for um, women and men or adults and child in a very different manners, all this needs to be included in your methodology and the scientific approach to enrich the outcomes of the, of the project. Please bear that in mind. Be very specific. What are you going to do? When you're going to do it? And how you're going to be doing that? And why your project needs to be funded? Why is it different from other? And what is it really innovative in your research field? The project will also have to explain the training that you will receive as a fellow, both, as I mentioned before, concerning your scientific aspects and non-scientific, meaning, for instance, how to deal with IPR, the, the, the intellectual property, how to talk in public, how to find public funding, many other aspects outside of the labs, I would say. Um, but remember, these always have to be customized via a career development plan because your needs will not be the same as a different researchers with a very, I would say, similar proposal. So always try to customize that to your needs and expectations. Um, what else? I will say this transfer of knowledge is really essential. Profiles there needs to be a good match between you as a researcher and the supervisor that you have at your institution. And you need to be able to really give yourself enough knowledge to share and, and to really then transmit to the institution and transfer to the rest of Europe and to your research field. 
Concerning impact, the impact will be evaluated at very different levels. Concerning your professional career, we mentioned that before, you need to try to explain the impact of the competencies that you have acquired. Will you see yourself with more international network? Have you improved your leadership skills? Do you think you can envisage a career maybe outside of the academia? If this is the case, then say where and how, for instance. And besides the results, of course, you will be producing results. How will you optimize them and maximize them? You need to give clear information on the actions and the channel so you, will, you will have to reach the different audiences. You will attend conferences, you will produce paper, you will address policymakers with specific studies. How will you be doing that? And finally, impacts beyond the duration of the projects have to be explained and quantified if possible. Here, you need a good alignment, as I mentioned before, for the beginning with all these EU scientific policies, sustainable development goals, the roadmap in the scientific field that you are uh, delivering. And finally, I will say, and this is very European jargon, implemented a European project requires managing the project, managing the activities, managing the funding, and also taking into account that it's a live project, so you will have a risk, and this risk needs to have a contingency plan. Please um, be aware of that. So the EU will ask you to really describe your work plan, the monitoring system that you have that you will have in place and all the scientific and managerial risk that you need to handle and um, very very quickly to start finishing this just to let you know that this is a very popular call last year there were more than 7000 proposals received by the european commission out of which 100 1235 projects were funded. What I'm leaving you here is the success rate and the number of projects that were funded, funded in each of the different scientific panels so that each of you in your own interest can have a look. We will share, of course, this information with you in the European um, fellowships and also in the global fellowships. I mentioned at the beginning, and I will send you a slide on that because I realize now that I don't have it, uh, that there is a threshold of 70% to reapply uh, and this is really a threshold just to reapply. But the reality, and maybe Maruf will say something about this, is that the scores are really much higher. This is an excellent uh, program, and you need to really high be there at 90, 91, 92, 93 percent of score. So really take time to really devote time to all the different all the different sections. And just to finalize, I don't know how I'm doing on, on time, but I think I'm I'm almost there. So just a final, I will say tips. Remember, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not only a research project. Please find the right balance between research and training. Both of them are very, very important. The project, it's a scientific uh, project, but it needs to be feasible in time and with the resources that are established. Include really realistic outcomes and activities. You can be a wish ambitious, and that's good, but don't be over ambitious because that can be penalized. Be precise and be coherent. You have 10 pages to really specify the most possible, all that you want to do in these two or three years projects. And I think a good complementarity, a good match, I mentioned that before, between the fellow and the supervisor is really needed. Um, what will the supervisor contribute with? What is the fellow good at? And how are the two profiles interacting with each other, I would say. Remember, um, the evaluators are human beings, just like you and me, and actually we recommend you to really subscribe as, as evaluator also, because it's the only way also sometimes to see how a project is, is written. Um, these are silent scientists, uh, so you need to be very accurate on how you write things and how you explain your science. But at the same time, they might not be from your same research line, so they might not have that same expertise. So you need to be also understandable and attractive enough for evaluators who are not experts in the field. It's not only about excellence, you need to achieve the highest score in the three sections, okay? And that's very important. Dedicate time and efforts to all of them. Include visuals whenever possible to explain a methodology to work on a Ganshan, for instance. And you know what? It's not about being the best researchers with the best CV. It's also about showing that your CV is the most adequate to execute these activities and also show that this project will really impact your career. And that's also very important. 
And I would say MSEA is a bottom-up approach, but you need to remember that you are conducting a research to tackle specific problem. And this needs to be aligned with global priorities and global challenges. Please have that in mind. And try to define pro pro uh, properly the outcomes during the project and the impacts way after the end of the project. Give examples that are measurable. You know, what is not quantified doesn't exist. So that's all the information for me. And now, where do I have to go? What do I have to do? I always go to the official information site. That is the funding and tenders opportunities portal. You also have the research executive agency and the European Commission website with a lot of information. You need to be aware of all the documents that are there. There are the official ones where you will find the templates that I've been showing you, the part B section, and all the information about eligibility, for instance. And just finishing with a few words on the projects that brought me here today. This is the MSCA Net project. is a European project project funded by the Commission that supports us as national contact point to give you um, a better, a better, um, I would say, service. We have a lot of material to prepare calls. We have a shortly uh, a handbook will be an updated handbook for this call will be updated on the platform. And we have a platform, an opportunity if you are a researcher, an institution, um, a supervisor, and you are interested in one of these calls, you can also log in there and show us your interest. And of course, this is not in this slide here. But very important, as Ahmed mentioned at the beginning, the hosting offers that are available in your access. If you're still not aware of a research group, you're still searching from somewhere to go to Europe, go to your access website and have a look there. And I hope I gave you some information to know a little bit more about this MSCA program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christiana. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you. So full of insights and very um, educating. Thank you for the insights. Most of, well, one of the things or part of the things I've picked up from what she said, and I hope you did too. She said it's a bottom up approach. So you can get your own topics and, but then it has to be in line with the sustainable development goals. It has to be in line with EU policies. It has to have an impact. So she went for that to give us um, very good dates and budgets that we have to put it, keep in mind when the project starts, uh, when the call opened, when the call is closing. I hope we got all of those dates. Then she told us about the, offers of the MSCA postdoctoral fellowship. She talked about the European postdoctoral fellowship and the global postdoctoral fellowship. And she made um, very good um, examples of all, all of them so that we can follow. Um, the good thing is that this recording is going to be available in the UREXES Africa website, and it's going to be sent to you if, yeah, if you need them the recordings will be available so that you will know everything you need to know about applying for this um, postdoctoral fellowship. Thank you so much, Christina, once again. Um, there will be a Q&A session where you have to ask all your questions. Yes, it will be, it will be um, I think Christina will be here to um, answer them. So thank you so much. So, um, our last speaker today is going to be Marush Sani, and he's going to be telling us practical experience because he has gone through this fellowship. He knows he he's talking from experience. So he's going to tell us from experience how he went about his own, his own experience as an MSCA um, P, um, postdoctoral fellowship person. So he's an assistant director at the National Center of Technology and Management. It's an agency of the Federal Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation in Nigeria. And he has his PhD in public policy. So the next speaker you're going to be hearing, thank you so much, Maru, for being here with us. You'll be listening to him as he shares his experiences with us. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Precious. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation from uh, Christina. That was a lot. I think when uh, Precious said, all you need to know about MSA, believe me when I said, Christina actually said everything that you need to know about this particular program. He said everything, actually. So I'm very glad to, to hear that. So based on that, I'm just going to be sharing my experience, what I actually went through, you know, while I was on this particular, you know, program. 
So my name, as uh, she rightly said, is Maru Sonny, and I work with National Center for Technology Management. So this is what the outline looks like. I'm going to give us a little bit about uh, the background. Then I'm going to discuss uh, my project, what are the opportunities therein, and what are the challenges that I face that I feel some other potential applicants may also want to, to know. And from there, I'll give us, you know, some advice and uh, concluding remarks. Of course, this particular one was uh, <clears throat> carried out uh, in Europe, Italy to be, to be precise. And as uh, Christina said, the idea is to enhance, you know, the creativity and innovation within a particular, you know, area or of a particular, you know, experienced researcher. The, the word there is experience because you must, you know, have a PhD before you could actually apply to this particular, you know, fellowship. And as uh, she said, you can apply from any country, you know, and again, the good thing is that um, you can also apply from any, any discipline as, uh, as it is. Then the, it could also be used to, you know, to kickstart your career just in case you've been away for a while. For instance, if you are a mother, you've just given birth and you've been away from research for a while, you could actually, you know, you know kickstart your research using this particular opportunity. So my host uh, institution is actually called European Institute on Economics and Environment. So, and they have different divisions. And the one where I actually worked was uh, Sustainable Earth Modeling Economics. That's my own division. And I'm gonna say this, this is important because um, when you are trying to choose a host, choose the one that has some relationship to what you're actually gonna do. You don't take it for granted that because they've accepted your proposal, then it's fine. Make sure when you are selecting host country or even host institution, be sure that they are actually doing what exactly that you need to achieve. So that way you could all relate on the on the same on the same level. So this particular institute, um, they were actually being funded by two agencies, one in the US, and that is called Resources for the Future, and the other one in Italy is called Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. My supervisor is Professor Elena Pedolina, a very good woman. Then my project supervisor. Uh, that's them. Then the one, uh, my project manager is the uh, doctor, you know, Casanelli. I'm going to, you know, do it briefly on these two people. Uh, one good thing I found about the institution, which is EIE, is that they actually gave me a project manager. So I would advise any potential applicant to also seek for that, just in case the institution or the hostel institution do not have that. You need to find a way to allow you, get, especially if that particular you know, country is not English speaking countries. For instance, if you are coming from an English speaking country and you are going to Italy or Germany, for instance, you may need to cut through a lot of red tips and there will be a lot of bureaucracy involved. So our advice in that case that you have somebody who will serve like a manager who will you know, run you through some of these issues because you are gonna be meeting people who will not be speaking the same language. So you need somebody who will actually be by your side in those areas. Then again too, there are so many other things that you will have to go through. So if you have a manager, for instance, who could help you do some of those things, then you can face the research, you know, squarely without having to bother about the bureaucracy of the, maybe the agency or even the country getting a permit, for instance. So all those things are actually very important when you, when you are applying, you need to take them into consideration. Christina also said something like, um, something around this particular issue. This particular program is, you know, reverse excellence. So it's very highly competitive. You know, I'm just going to use uh, Nigeria as a case study. Since 2014, only 161 researchers you know, have been able to participate. And for this particular one individual fellowship, only nine postdocs have been able to participate. Look at that since 2014. So that tells you how competitive this particular, you know, program is. So when you're applying, you also need to take that into consideration. You also need to be sure that you have enough time to prepare. Don't wait until the last minute. Now I'm also gonna say this, just in case I don't forget. When you're applying, so you look at the date. The date, I think it opens around 14th and it's close around September, you know, maybe middle of September. Don't be deceived by the number of months there. Because what you need to do is, first of all, find a host country. That may take a lot of time. Then you also need to work with your host country or even host institution so that you could develop a proposal together. That again, also take a lot of time. There'll be a lot of iteration between you and your potential supervisors, for instance. So 
you need to be sure <laughs> that you have the host institution right then you also have a supervisor who will guide you through you know the proposal because the proposal is like um, you know bilateral thing in which you and your supervisor will have to look through some of the intricacies within your proposal and make sure the whole thing is fine-tuned before you can submit as a matter of fact they are the one that will submit on your behalf you don't get to submit the proposal so they have to be involved from the beginning to the end so in that case you have to be sure that you have the host institution at the right time. They make sure you also have a lot of time to actually write your, your proposals. So again, this again borders on around the, the competitiveness of this particular you know, fellowship. The title of my own uh, program or project is SNN Sourcing Strategy for Environmental Innovation and Industrial Sector in the, of Nigeria. So this is what I worked on. But one thing you also need to do when you're applying is that you need what they call an acronym. So you also need to get that, at least have that at the back of your mind that you're also gonna come up with something like that. Mine is Ecodex. And what I did was to, or what we did rather, was to find a way to carve out an, uh, an acronym for that particular project, which does not really relate directly, even though they are saying the same thing with the title of the project. So again, have that at the back of your mind. You know, um, Christian was also saying about the cutoff mark, even though the cutoff mark is 70, I have to do this three times. As a matter of fact, I started in 2016 and I didn't get it until 2018 call. That tells you that this is this was not, you know, a, this it was not really, really easy. And look at the score. My score was actually 84% in the first instance. Then second instance, I got 84. Yet I was not taken until the third when I actually got around 89. That was when the, the, the proposal was actually such. That again tells you how competitive this particular you know, program is. Then I'm gonna give credit to my supervisor here because she was actually the one who, who kept push, pushing me. Again, I was telling you, you also need to get, see if you can get a very good friend supervisor who could actually you know, see you through this. So she was the one who kept on calling me, which I'll say, write me an email again, say, Maruba, I know this is not successful again, so can we give it a try? Then I'll say, okay, fine, let's do, let's see what we can do. So what, how did we get it wrong the other time? Then we look at the proposal again and find a way to rewrite the proposal. So we did it this first time, the second time, then the third time we were, we were lucky and we were able to get uh, some of those things. What we have here are the pictures of some of the, you know, what we actually did. But again, too, you know, one thing about the program is that as you go through a lot of training in Europe, it's also important that you also find a way to transfer the knowledge back to the people back home. And this is what I did here. What I did was to organize a proposal writing workshop for the members of my, you know, institute back in Nigeria. So, you know, I, I tried to, you know, tell them what they need to do to, to apply for this program. At the same time, what are, what are the criteria that I actually needed for this particular program? What you see here, I don't know whether you can see my cursor. These are, these are my colleagues in, uh, in Italy. And uh, this is one of our expeditions, you know, in Italy where we're trying to um, pack or relax as the case may be. This is the flyer for the program. Then one other thing you will need to learn is that um, once you have an accepted proposal, what you will have to do is to make sure that all the work packages are in order. And this is what I, I can, I'm trying to show you here. There are work packages that you need to make sure that they actually link one another. For instance, now, what are the areas that you're actually working on? What are the, you know, research activities that have been done in that particular area? What are the methods that have been used in that particular area? What does the report and writing looks like? Then again, you are gonna be disseminating your output. How do you go about that? This must be stated in your proposal. It must be written, you know, clearly. Then one of the outputs, you know, in the project, in my own project is actually, you know, publications. And we've been able to do this. Again, too, what I would say here is that don't be too ambitious. You may say, oh, it's, a bit, it's just two years, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and see whether I, whether I can write 10 papers. No, you cannot write 10 papers within two years. Otherwise, you're just going to overburden yourself with a lot of things that are not actually necessary. So be, don't be too be ambitious, of course, but don't be too ambitious in the sense that um, you want to be sure that whatever you say you do, you have to do it. But once it is written down, and say, okay, I'm going to do A, B, C, then you must do it. There's no running away from that particular. That is, it is based on that, that you have been funded. So people want to see the result. What I did in my own case that I simply just said, I'm going to write two papers, even though I ended up you know, writing three, but then it's good for you to actually exceed the target rather than just you know, be behind the, 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 the target. So here now I have three, three papers that I've written. One's been uh, it's already accepted. The other two, I recently got a positive response on one. Then the other one is still under review, review process. So 
Christina was saying the other time that you shouldn't just look at research alone. You should also look at the fact that you could also get trained, you know, in Europe. So again, to this is one thing I also will advise you know, the potential applicants to, to look into. Be sure that you attend a lot of trainings, you know, in Europe once you're once you're there or any other country that you that you choose to have this particular program. Then attend a lot of conferences. Unfortunately, during my own case, you know, this is when we had COVID-19 pandemic. So I couldn't really go out that much, but I attended a lot of you know online online conferences and workshops. So again, too, don't let that deter you. Wherever you are, make sure you attend a lot of conferences that are actually relevant to what, uh, what you are trying to do. Because that will do you know two things you know for you as a young scholar. The first thing is that you get to meet a lot of people so that you can network. I met quite a lot of people that have actually read their articles, you know, so I could meet them in person. That for me will actually help you a lot. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of my articles, the one just that, that got published, I actually sent it through one of the scholars in this particular, in my particular field. So I think that will help you network. Then again, too, you also get to know a lot of, you know, methodologies in those, some of those, uh, some of those conferences. So it's important for you to actually attend workshops and, uh, and the conferences. So what are the opportunities? I already said some of, uh, some of these opportunities. So the first one that, of course, it will help you improve the, your skills and competencies, you know, then of course you get to move around. You are not just going to be in Italy, for instance, you also get to be in other European countries. You could actually even go back to your country if you have a very relevant, you know, activity that you need to, you know, you need to achieve in that, in that area. Then you also get to see, cooperate with a lot of, you know, authors. For instance, now one of my articles, I actually collaborated with um, a guy within my, within my institute. So you get to, you know, collaborate on, uh, on authorship. Then again, too, you also get to, you know, understand better how to write proposals. You know, there are big grants out there. You know, writing them takes skills. It takes, you know, some dexterity to be able to do that. So in that way, you also get to learn some of, uh, some of these things. So at the same time, you now as a young scholar, your feasibility will be increased. You know, people get to see you and they get to know who you are in person and you can actually relate, you know, based, uh, based on that. Then one other thing is that you also get to be, you know, a reviewer of some of these proposals. You know, some of these MC, MC proposals, you also get to be a reviewer. Once you've gone through, through the process, then they get to select you as one of the, as one of the reviewers. Then what are the challenges that I actually, you know, met on this particular program? One that, that is actually striking is that um, before I left, you know, this, this, was the first, this was the first time. So there are so many things that I really did not know. And one of them is what, uh, one of them concerns, you know, how, what is the arrangement of the project like? Who am I even going to meet? For instance, now, when I got to, you know, Italy, I didn't even know where the institute, you know, is. And this is what I think, I don't know whether it's RARX can, that can manage this or even EU. I don't even know where the institute is, so I need to keep, you know, searching. So before you leave home, if you are going to be doing it in Europe, be sure that you know exactly where that particular agency is, where you're going. Then one other thing is also regards accommodation. You know, you need to secure accommodation before you leave. Otherwise, you you have no place to, you know, to sleep. Otherwise, you probably go and sleep in a hotel. In my own case, I have to sleep in a hotel for like a month. And you know how much that will cost you. So it's important that before you even leave home, make sure that you have accommodation ready before before you leave, if that is possible. It's something you should you know you should do. Then obtaining employment contract and the social security is also something you should consider before you leave. Make sure that your institutions in Europe or any other country where you are going, uh, they've been able to sort that out before you actually you actually leave. Because for me, in my own case, I had to wait for like a, maybe close to a month before I could start the project. Because without that, without a contract, there was no way I could I could actually start you know the project. So I would advise again that um, you have that sorted out before before you you leave uh, your your hometown. Then. Uh, the Christina was saying something about tax, and I was just shaking my head. You know, I know Christina was showing us the unit cost for that particular, you know, project. What you see is good, but uh, <laughs> try to understand that once you get there, there are so many other costs that are involved. I, 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 I could see something like four thousand. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not, you are not going to get four thousand euro. <laughs> you are going to get a bit uh, much more less than that because you are going to pay tax. This is something I was not really clear with before leaving. The money is good, but you say, wow, this is a lot of money. But the truth is, once you get there, you're not going to get that, uh, that kind of money because you're going to pay a lot of tax. You know? And this is what's applicable to everyone anyway. So it's not as if you are being you know, targeted, so to say. So everybody's paying tax, and you're also you know, going to pay tax. But one thing 
that happens, you know, I don't know whether this also happens in other countries, but in Italy, that's what they call declaration of value. This is a document that you need to get that will allow you to reduce, you know, the level of tax that you'll be paying. But in my own case, but the, 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 the program or the, the, the bureaucracy there was so tedious that I couldn't even do it. So what, what I would advise in this case is that uh, before you leave home, you can something, it's a process that you can start. It's a process that you can Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thanks. So this particular document called Declaration of Value is something you, I would advise that you start because it's something you can start before you, you leave. For instance, now they want you to certify your, you know, your PhD certificate. They also like to, to certify your, even for, for instance, in Nigeria, your SSC, your master's degree, your BSc degree, they should be certified. And they have to run that through a particular agency in Italy before they will be able to give you that particular document. So it takes a lot of time before you can do that. And in my own instance, I had my PhD in, in South Africa. Now imagine me sitting down in uh, Europe and trying to certify a document in South Africa. That's gonna be a lot of, so before you leave them, what I would advise is that you try and do that before you even, you even leave. So that way, by the time you get to Europe, that will already have, will have been you know, sorted out. So with regards to, to advice, there's what they call ethics. And this is also part of what you are going to see in your application you know, form. What I would advise you to do is that whatever you want to go and do in Europe, make sure that uh, the ethical considerations um, are, are met. But this is very important. Without that, you probably your proposal will not fly. So you want to be sure that all the ethics are in order before, before you leave. Even, even what we are going to be collecting is just uh, a survey, a survey instrument. Make sure the ethical generation uh, are in order before, before you leave. Then again, too, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be collecting primary data? This is also very important. For me, I need to collect primary data. But then after, when I was in Europe, then it becomes an issue. How they will allow me to go home and spend like a month or two to collect data. And I was like, how am I going to get this done without collecting data? So again, too, you need to sort that out with your supervisor. Are, you, are they going to require that you use you know, secondary data, are they going to tell you to come do your research or your lab work in Europe or is it something you want to do in India? So make sure that that is well sorted out before you leave. Again, I already discussed the issue of accommodation. Make sure that that is also sorted out before you leave. The creation of value, I already said something, you know, about that. Then network with top researchers as much as you can. This is also very, very important. I'm also going to advise that subscribe to URX Africa because this is where the information is. You know, applicants, you know, that are coming from Africa, you need to go to that website and actually source. This is something I did not do when I was looking for my host uh, institution. But now that I know, I think you also need to need to do that. So this is what the calls look like. And this is these are the opening dates, then the deadline. I already said you see, don't wait, don't think that because it's April and the deadline is in September, you have to wait. You cannot wait. You need to get your host institution now, and once that is done write a proposal, they will ask for a proposal because it's like a two-state thing. The first thing that you do is that they will ask for your proposal. Then you write one that is accepted. Then you now blow it up, use the template, you know, from uh, EU. One that is done, then they will help you submit around September. This is how it is done. As I said, there will be a lot of iterations between you and your supervisor. So you can't wait until September before you start looking for hosts. Oh, if you do that, you won't, you won't have any success in trying to apply for some of these uh, programs. So it's something you have to do, you know, much more earlier. So in, in conclusion, so as I said, don't give up too easily because it's going to take some time before you, if you are lucky, you may get this, you know, you know the, the first time. If you are not, maybe twice, second, maybe third time, but don't, don't give up too easily. It's something that is actually possible that you can, that you can do. Then try and be capacity at home. As I said earlier on, you know, mentor some other scientists that you have at home that will also, you know, help you, you know, as a, as a young scholar. Then I'm also thinking URX, you know, Africa may need to link up with some of the fellows coming from Africa, for instance. They, you know, that's, that, that's so much that we really do not know. So maybe there's a way URX Africa can link them up with national contact points in from their country. This, I think, will actually not only help the young scholars, will also help URX Africa, you know, achieve some of the objective for which that particular, you know, organization is set up. Then again, so I also think URS Africa may also want to, you know, 
follow some of the MCS thank you, know, you very scholars much. or fellows. So that way they can also, you know, get to achieve the objective of that particular you know, organization. This way I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maruf. Thank you for that very enlightening presentation. Um, we are very grateful to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open the live session now for question and answer. So if you have a question to either Christine, to Ahmed, to Maruf, please just signify by a raise of your hand and you will be given the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you for staying up to this time. And I'm hoping you are having a wonderful time. <laughs> Okay, there's a hand raised. Is it eleven you? Can we hear no. from you? Please turn on your mic. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, all the three presenters. Uh, it was uh, informative, uh, and thank you. Uh, my question is uh, uh, basically how to get potential supervisor from Europe. Uh, because one of the challenges here is uh, how to link research ideas. Um, in one of the slides, I... Um, uh, uh, have uh, come up with the, the information saying that the, the project is mainly implemented in Europe. Implemented in Europe. That means uh, those research ideas uh, from Africa may not be, uh, may not be that much uh, uh, compatible with the, the projects in Europe. So how, how, to, how to get uh, those potential uh, supervisors who can who can uh, synchronize uh, mainly ideas from Africa to Europe, or mainly uh, from Europe, or how, how to how to get projects, how to get potential supervisors. Because last year I was trying to get uh, a professor from Europe for the Humboldt uh, research. Mm -hmm. uh, after 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 uh, trying for forty professors, finally. Uh, I succeeded to get a professor from uh, Germany. Uh, 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 then we uh, wrote a proposal uh, uh, because of the, uh, the competition. Uh, I didn't succeed. Uh, anyhow, there, there was a very long process of uh, getting a single professor uh, for that project. Uh, anyhow, that, that, that may be a natural, but is there anything any short uh... okay i think i think i get your question yeah um you're asking how to get um potential supervisors and the projects so yeah. i think again, again, you'd like again, to answer that again is, is, is the research focus mainly related to europe that's also my question yeah. If the research focus is mainly re related to Europe, Christiana, please, would you like to share? Well, I, I can I can maybe share some some of my insight, and I, I don't know if 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 our researcher who actually got a a, um, a project in Italy in this case can maybe expand. But I think first of all, the idea is for you to be able to link with somebody in Europe where the research will take place, meaning. Normally, um, ma many projects just come up uh, come out of, of personal collaboration and personal networks that you might have in your own institution. If this is not the case, my recommendation will be to have a look at the CODIS website, which is a website where all the EU projects, the results are available, and have a look with keywords in your research area what is being funded by the European Commission, because that will give you maybe a hint or the collaborators or potential collaborators that you might have in Europe. Now, I have to say that you sometimes get projects that are based in Europe, of course, but that can be that can come from 
from, uh, I would say, well, that can include field work to specific regions in the world, including Africa, for instance, and that will take the benefits of the results of these studies outside of Europe and bring them back, I would say, to European context or to European dimension. That's very important, of course. And apart from the CORDIS tool that I mentioned to you, you have the hosting offers, many of them, and when I'm saying many of them, I'm talking about hundreds. I don't know how many are available right now, but we can reach three, 400 of proposals from European institutions to for researchers all over the world who applied in the URAXIS website. So I think that's a good point to start. And of course, have a look at your natural, I would say, collaborators in your field, what's going on in your research, in your research field throughout the world. I don't know if the researcher, um, Maruf, you will like maybe to expand on that, if that was your case. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, thank, thank you very much, Christian. I think I think you 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 actually said it all. But what I will add is that in my own case, let me also bring my experience to bear on that. In my own case, what happened was that I actually got an a, like an advert from my host institution saying they need so so and so and so. They need a proposal in that particular area. Since it fits into what I'm doing, I simply just put up a proposal, like I think a three-page proposal. They asked for that, so I did that, and based on that, I was able to get in into that particular host institution before. We now started looking at uh, what we what we need to do to actually write you know a bigger proposal that will submit to EU. So what happened was that it was after that that they actually gave me a supervisor that I was working with. So it depends. First of all, I think you could also check URAX Africa website, see what they what they have. Yeah, some of these courses will be there. Then again, to you also have where you can also check the host, check the host institution and see what they are doing. If it's in line with what you are doing, then fine. Then from there you can probably look for supervisors, you know, that are doing something in the area that you're actually also working with. You said something like whether everything is about Europe. No, not, not everything. You, mine was in Nigeria. My focus was in Nigeria. So I work within, within, within Nigeria. So you could also have a project which is situated in Nigeria, but which should be carried out in Europe. It doesn't have to be what is happening in Europe, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Thank you, Maruf. I think, have your question be answered? I think so. Are there any other questions or should I um, just read some questions I have here? Is there anybody that wants, okay, there are no yeah. hands raised. Yeah, I do have uh, questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for Christi. My question is to uh, Christiana and uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I obtained my PhD July 2015, and by the deadline of this application, I would have eight years and two months. Am I still eligible to apply for this scholarship? Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, the, the, um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I got you say, if you said eight years and two months, I, I, I don't know if I got it right. But the eight years actually research experience, it's it's a question that we get a lot, a lot of questions on eligibility. Um, what you need to take into account is that we talked about eight years of active research since you got your PhD. Uh, prior to this deadline. So here, what is important for you to take into account, it's not only when you got your PhD, that can happen 10 years before uh, 13th of September, 2023. But if in those 10 years, you haven't really carried out any research because you were unemployed or because you had a paternal leave or because you were out of research and you were doing a different type of job, not doing research, then even if your PhD was 10 years ago, this time out of research will not count towards the eight years. So this will be reduced. The specific tool for you to check if you're eligible, but please remind that it's not about the eight years only. It's about if you have done research in those eight years, that will sum mm. up eight years. That's very important. Okay. Thank you. And of course, but, but th there is a deadline. If you are eight, eight years and uh, 15 days plus, maybe you are not eligible. That can happen. Unfortunately. Thank you so much, Christina. I can see your hand, Christella. We have um, just about seven minutes left for this question and answer session. So please, if you can make your questions very brief, straight to the point, it will give the speakers, um, you will have more time to engage with the speakers. So um, Christella, 
Um, can we have you? Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to thank all everyone who presented. I met Christina and Murav. It makes me to learn a lot. But presently, I'm a final year PhD student. I have to precise it. I'm a final year PhD student, but I've been interested in Marie Curie like for, for the past three years because uh, I'm presently in Italy as a visiting PhD student. And my professor has always, he wants me to apply. <laughs> so when checking through the conditions to apply, I think one of the conditions that states is if you have been residing in the country, which is supposed to be your host country for more than, um, I think 12 months, you can apply for the Marie Curie Fellowship in that country. It's true, I was just every year, I just look at the call just to see if this criteria has changed. So if I'm interested to apply for the Marie Curie immediately my P, after my PhD defense, that's next year, does it mean I have to choose for another host country which is not Italy, or I have to spend one year out of Italy before I apply for the Marie Curie. Okay, yes. thank you very much for your question. Now, unfortunately, if you are carrying out your PhD right now in Italy, it means that you've been there for a long time. And it means that you will not be able to uh, ask for fellowships. Uh, I mean, at least a European fellowship in Italy, you will not be eligible uh, because of the mobility rule. You will not comply with it. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess that answers the question. I can see John. John, can you have the floor? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So uh, I wanted to ask um, two questions. The first one is that um, when you are making the application, the, the project you choose, should it if you have a project which um, veers off a little bit um, your basic research um, you know, area, so you are moving into another field, uh, is it also possible to um, you know, apply for such a project through the uh, Marie Curie Fellowship? Um, and then the second one will be, can you deal with two institutions at the same time whilst trying to come to a conclusion as to what to, which one to choose? If that's okay with Maruf, I will maybe, um, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes I, can, I can hear you. That's I, fine, Christina, you can go ahead. I will, I will add. Uh, I, I, will, I, I will maybe let you answer the first one concerning the, the research field and if there is a change in the research field, because I think that's more from a scientific point of view. <laughs> but um, concerning the possibility to apply with two different institutions is not possible. You will have to choose one. And uh, for me, you have to take many aspects into consideration. You have to really see who will be your supervisor at the institution. And if the institution you are going to is really the best one where you are gonna be able to perform the activities you want to perform. Um, so, but you need to choose among one of the two institutions. And I suggest you to do it quite early in the process, not leave it until last minute, because there's a lot of information that the institution also has to provide you with concerning training, concerning infrastructure and so on. Okay, okay. Uh, so, Yeah, thank you, John. What with, with regards to whether you could, you know, view via off, you know, a little bit from your from your area. I think that's 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 a tricky one. And why I'm saying that is this because um, remember this Marie Curie actually is talking about experienced researcher, and you must be able to demonstrate that. And your CV must be able to show that you have experience in that particular area. So if you are going to veer off, how do you now convince them that your CV is saying exactly that you actually have an experience in that particular area? So I think you need to find a balance between your, your, your field and where you actually intend to go. Because the balance must, you must be able to demonstrate that, look, I have experience in this particular area. Remember, it's actually for experienced researcher experience that particular field that you are intent you are intending to go, then that becomes you know tricky. Again, too, you also need to discuss it with your supervisor. If it's something that will fly, I think he or she may be able to tell you. If it's not going to fly, then he or she may also be able to advise you on that. Okay. All right, thank you. 
I think that answers the question. Um, Florence, I can see your hand raised. Is Florence with us? Sorry, can I speak? I'm toying. I've been raising my hand too. I don't know if you saw my hand. I've not seen. Um, Adi Emo Salami. Adi Emo okay. Salami. Go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Toyin, please. Yes, compliment. Ahead. Compliments. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Well done, presenters. I just want to ask, what is the um, pronunciation, the spelling of the codis that you were saying that we could check to know who are those that are um, seeking for researchers? to apply. I didn't uh, get the uh, spelling from the way you pronounced it. So I don't know if I, if you could please spell out the, the yeah, word. Yeah, uh, then I will try to write it uh, for you. Uh, if I can in the chat, I was uh, having a look if it's possible for me to include it or maybe for had met to include the website is C-O-R-D-I-S, Cordis. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. God bless you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take the last question. We just have one minute left. So we'll take the last question um, from Mary Etsuka. Are you still there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Okay. okay, thank you very much to all the presenters. I'm trying to be very fast now. Um, I have had a PhD sandwich fellowship program in Italy for the past three years, but uh, it's been six months in Italy, six months in Africa, six months in Italy, and I'm rounding up my PhD program. I just wanted to find out if I'm eligible. Sorry, I, I was muted there, I was muted, sorry. So first thing, um, and I haven't said it at the beginning, I should have, and it's important. We as national contact points are not allowed, I will say, or cannot confirm or deny an eligibility. It's not up to us. We, we are not entitled to do uh, so. What we do is that we guide you through the rules of participation, but it should be your institution, the institution who is going to recruit you, who should have all the documents that you might send them to really check if you comply with your eligibility, okay? Because the case you mentioned being in two different countries at specific times, that you, you need to check that very carefully on a case by case basis, okay? okay? So I cannot really answer that live because it could be a mistake from my side. Okay. okay, so you can maybe send me a message to me or to the Italian NCPs, and we can try to somehow direct you the answer. But um, it's not, I will say, a legitimized one. I mean, I can, of course, if you tell me I've been living in Italy for the last four years and I want to apply for Italy, I can tell you you're not eligible. But cases that can be very tricky, and we need to go uh, through each of them case by case. Okay, okay. Thank you. So Please, where Thank do I send you. the email to? Um, Christiana, she was saying, where should she send the email to? Sure, uh, you can have, I think my my uh, email was uh, shared maybe, I think in my in my last uh, slide, but if not, is uh, Christina uh, dot, uh, let me check, sorry, because I don't have it open here. But it's christina.gomez at fesit.es. Let me check here if I have it here with me. And I'll just put it my last side on, on the screen for you to have it in, in case you have any. Um, here it is. Or MSCA, because it's actually our. Here, there you have it. MSCA at fesit.es. My own personal one, which is Christina. Dots. Okay, at this point, I have to say thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Ahmed, Christina, and Maruf. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you so much for your contributions and making the session a very beautiful one. In case we haven't answered your question, please go to our website, go to Eurexus Africa. Go to visit our web please can you mute um visit our website and we will give you answers or send us a mail 
This recording will be made available to all the participants and it will be on the UXS African website too. So thank you very much for this session. We hope you, you are well informed and you are now equipped to apply for the MSCA postdoctoral fellowship and we hope you get it. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao, bye. Ciao. bye. Well bye. done. Well done. Bye. Well done, Dr. Sonny. Well done. Bye bye. Bye. Thank ciao. You.